and welcome to the Walter P. Chrysler Museum in Auburn Hills, Michigan. My name is Barry Dressel. I'm the manager here. And this museum, opened in 1999, is something of which Daimler Chrysler is very proud because the American tradition of Chrysler is very important to Daimler Chrysler Corporation. We're standing in the atrium of the museum, and behind me you see a pylon on which are displayed some of the most significant designs produced by Chrysler Corporation. Quickly, the car directly in back of me is this 1931 Chrysler LeBaron dual Califaton introduced in 1931. For many, the most collectible and the most beautiful of the full classic Chryslers. Uh, opposite, the red car is a sort of retro exercise from 1941 in the same dual Califaton body style. That's the Chrysler Newport. There were five of those built, and one of them actually paced the Indianapolis 500, the first and last time that was ever done by a concept car. On top of it, the silver car that you see coming around as the pylon slowly rotates is also from 1941. It's a Chrysler Newport. Uh, again, five of these were produced, and these were considered extremely futuristic designs. Uh, the most remarkable thing about the car is that it's essentially a roadster with a retractable hardtop, an electrically retracting hardtop. Considering that soft top convertibles had only a couple of years before gotten power tops, this was considered extremely advanced. Then the car that you see with its tail headed towards us uh, with those sort of uh, spaceship uh, reflectors in the back, that's a turbine car from 1962. Chrysler had for two decades an active program in terms of adapting the gas turbine to automobile use. This was a very successful design, but it never went into production. Uh, it, it simply was not a cost-effective design to do. And then finally at the top, coming around, the red car is the, the concept car for the Dodge Viper that led to the production of that V10 engine sports car. Walter Chrysler was born in 1875 into a railroading family. Uh, despite his family's desires that he do something else, he followed his father, who was a railroad engineer, uh, into the railroad industry and insisted on training as a machinist. Uh, like most uh, apprentices of his time, part of his apprenticeship program was making some of his own tools. Later on, when Chrysler became a prominent figure in the automobile industry, he was very proud of the fact that he had started his uh, career in overalls and always referred to himself and his colleagues as American workmen. There were several things about Walter Chrysler as a man and the Chrysler Corporation as a company that were really unusual. Uh, from a standpoint of Walter Chrysler as a man, when he introduced the first Chrysler in 1924, most Americans had never heard of him. He had spent his career previously at Buick and then spent time uh, reorganizing Willis and then uh, what had been Maxwell Chalmers. At the time that the Chrysler was introduced in 1924, Maxwell was not a significant company at all. But the car that Chrysler introduced was extremely significant. In fact, it was several years ahead of its time. He was able to do this for a couple of reasons. One is Chrysler himself was an engineer who appreciated fine engineering. He was not something that was addicted to cut and try methods. Uh, although he had only completed a correspondence course in, in engineering, he had three lieutenants who were brilliant engineers in their own right. And in this diorama, Fred Zeter, who was always the spokesman of the group, is standing talking to Chrysler, sitting at his desk. This is, incidentally, an original desk from Chrysler's office at the Highland Park plant. Uh, the fellow with his back to you is Carl Breer, who was sort of the intellectual uh, driving force behind the trio, and the guy standing is Owen Skelton, who was known for solving practical problems that made the engineering advances possible. But what Walter Chrysler brought to this mix was, first of all, he was an extremely well-rounded automobile executive. He understood manufacturing, he understood engineering, uh, he understood uh, putting together a team and delegating, he understood finance, he understood marketing. And his concept for the 1924 Chrysler was very unique. He wanted a high-speed, quality car that was relatively light, small, and maneuverable. There's some possibility that Walter Chrysler himself was surprised by the success of his new car in 1924. After all, Maxwell had only been the 32nd ranked automaker. And when the car was extremely successful, 
they began to have to improvise plans to build on that success. The first thing that they did was rename Maxwell the Chrysler Corporation. Maxwell was a discredited name. And then what had formerly been the Maxwell was redesigned uh, and that became the Chrysler 58. Eventually it became the Chrysler 50. But Chrysler by that time, by the, by the late 1920s, was looking at the possibility that he wasn't just a successful manufacturer of an upper middle class price range car, he was somebody who potentially could build an automobile dynasty. But to accomplish that, what he had to do was he had to get more manufacturing facilities than he had. He could only produce about 200,000 cars in the facilities that Maxwell had. So what he undertook to do was acquire a much larger concern than Chrysler, and that was Dodge. This is a 1915 Dodge, and the Dodge brothers, who had both died within uh, basically 11 months of each other in 1920, had left their company to New York bankers, and it was not doing well. The company itself was huge. The, the Dodge brothers had gotten their start as suppliers of parts to Henry Ford's Model T and had built an empire based on the fact that they were massive suppliers of parts. And then when they got disenchanted with Henry Ford, they brought out their own car in 1914, which was also an immediate success with a legendary penchant for toughness. Uh, they started out using the word dependable and uh, owners would write in talking about the car's dependability. The word dependability went into the dictionary because of Dodge owners writing the company and talking about the car's dependability. But the cars really were not selling well by uh, the late 1920s because of a series of marketing decisions that the people who had succeeded the Dodge brothers had made. So Walter Chrysler was able to make a exchange of stock and acquire a much larger company. And with it, he acquired a loyal dealer network, he acquired foundry facilities, he acquired a uh, massive manufacturing and assembly plant. And on the basis of acquiring Dodge in 1928, Chrysler was able to create not just a Chrysler car, but a Chrysler corporation offering cars just as General Motors did for every pocketbook. The first thing that Walter Chrysler did was he offered a low-priced car to compete with Ford and Chevrolet. This was the Plymouth. It was introduced in 1928. The Plymouth featured hydraulic brakes uh, and a lot of the engineering features for which Chrysler had become so famous. This was really a redesigned version of the Chrysler 58, and it was introduced as uh, the Chrysler Plymouth initially. Uh, the car was extremely successful, and in fact, Chrysler Corporation rode the success of Plymouth into second place overall in the American market and thus in the world, right behind General Motors. They actually eclipsed Ford with this car. The way they did it was not competing with Ford, particularly in price, but just as they had with the 1924 Chrysler, cramming the car with engineering innovations and value. So the car was extremely successful. Chrysler continued to manufacture Dodge, but initially, below Dodge, Chrysler, in, for the model year 1929, introduced another new car, and that car was the DeSoto. This is a DeSoto Roadster from 1929, and Chrysler did a very interesting thing when they introduced it because they positioned it as a personal car, and they gave it a sort of Spanish flavor by naming it after Hernando DeSoto, and in fact, the initial uh, offerings had the, the body styles translated into Spanish, so that uh, a deluxe coupe, for example, became a coupe de lujo. Uh, this was interesting because later on, 50 years later, uh, we would introduce the uh, Chrysler Cordoba as another personal car uh, introduced by uh, an actor, Ricardo Montalban, who had a charming uh, Spanish accent, and of course the car had this sort of romantic Spanish flavor. So history tends to repeat itself in the automobile industry. But in any case, the DeSoto and the Plymouth were both extremely successful. Now, consider what Walter Chrysler had done. A man who most Americans had never heard from uh, before 1924, introduced a revolutionary car in 1925. The car was manufactured by an automaker that uh, 
most people thought was on its way out, was ranked 32nd in the industry. By 1928, he had acquired a much larger company, Dodge. He had brought out the Plymouth, he had brought out the DeSoto, and he was on his way to vaulting over uh, Ford as the second ranked producer. That same year, 1928, he also laid the cornerstone of what would briefly be the tallest building in the world, the Chrysler Building in New York. So this is it, this is the first Chrysler. In fact, this may be the very first Chrysler. Uh, this car has always been owned by Chrysler Corporation, uh, and there are a lot of features about this that are very early that lead us to believe that this is indeed the prototype. Uh, this car was revolutionary because for 1924, it offered a uh, engine that delivered a, s a solid 68 horsepower out of only a little over 200 cubic inches. It would do an honest 70 miles an hour out of the showroom. And when it was introduced, it revolutionized expectations of performance for this class of car. As a result, many of them were uh, imported and used for road racing in Europe, where they did very well. In 1928, for example, uh, Chrysler's finished uh, third and fourth at Le Mans, uh, right behind Bentley's. So this was really a remarkable achievement because Bentley obviously was a uh, custom-built racing machine. Uh, Chrysler was basically a car that catered to the upper middle class, but by no means was intended to be a uh, racing vehicle at all. There were a lot of other features about the car that were remarkable. First of all, uh, Chrysler insisted that he wanted a car that uh, was long-lived. So this car boasted both uh, full pressure lubrication at a time when everybody was using the sort of splash system where troughs on the bottom of the, of the uh, connecting rods kind of splashed uh, lubricant up into the bearings. It offered uh, oil filtration at a time when that was extremely rare, rare so that you had a car that lasted a lot longer. It offered other nice little touches like internally illuminated uh, gauges. It offered a temperature gauge on the dash instead of uh, on the radiator so that you didn't have a motometer, as they called them, uh, sticking out of the radiator so that they were able to put this nice little pair of uh, wings symbolizing mercury on the, uh, on the radiator cap. So there are a lot of things about the car that were really remarkable. But one of the most remarkable things about the car was that uh, Chrysler took uh, a hydraulic brake system that had been introduced by a man named Lockheed related to the uh, Lockheed that eventually went into the airplane business. They re-engineered this and midway through the development process decided that the car would be perfect if they fitted it with hydraulic brakes. After the Chrysler Corporation made its reputation with highly efficient six-cylinder engines and hydraulic brakes, they went on to do other things to improve automobiles. In fact, Chrysler was the only American automobile company or prominent American automobile company that really was a research and engineering driven company. Uh, General Motors had been organized by W.C. Durant who was basically a stock speculator and it was dedicated to making money. Nothing wrong with that. But General Motors said we're never going to lead with engineering. We're going to concentrate on being a profitable company. Henry Ford was concerned about building a universal car but to the extent that he could build that car and sell it to millions of people, that's what he was concerned about. He wasn't concerned necessarily about pushing the boundaries of automobile design and engineering. Walter Chrysler and his engineers were. And in the late 1920s, they began to be interested in the question of how much aerodynamics had an effect on the performance of an automobile. Did air resistance significantly affect how a car performed? Uh, the Chrysler engineers had gone very far in, in improving engines, but they wondered if cars would perform better, move faster, if there wasn't a problem uh, with air resistance. No one knew at that point. So the Chrysler engineers built a small wind tunnel with advice from uh, Orville Wright. And when they put the wind tunnel together, and this exhibit sort of demonstrates it, but this is the standard shape of the car in the late 1920s. And there was a significant amount of turbulence in back of that high, flat rear end. Just for fun, the Chrysler engineers turned that shape around and discovered to their amazement that if the car were headed backwards, it was significantly more aerodynamically efficient than if it was headed frontwards. This was a big revelation. And so they began to test different shapes. And what they ultimately came up with was a shape that had a rounded nose 
and a tapering tail. That was the most aerodynamically efficient shape. And if you compare that shape with the cars that we're building today, you find out that in terms of aerodynamic efficiency, this shape really holds its own. The problem with this sort of research was that this turned on its head the way cars were customarily built. They were still borrowing from the practice that had been used in the days of carriages, and in a sense, automobiles were still horseless carriages. Because particularly in sedans, the rear passengers, just as they did in horse-drawn carriages, sat on the rear seat, or sat on the rear axle, rather. The problem with this is the new aerodynamic shape had a tapering tail, and it created a headroom problem. You couldn't cram those passengers uh, into a tapering tail anymore. So what the Chrysler engineers did was took the passengers who had been sitting on the rear axles And they moved that passenger forward in the new body design. And what they discovered was that because the person was nearer the fulcrum of motion in the car, the amount of bounce that there was experienced by the passenger was significantly reduced. So here it is. This is the Chrysler Airflow. Actually, it wasn't supposed to be a Chrysler at all. It was supposed to be a DeSoto. But when Chrysler's engineers demonstrated the first prototype, which was developed in secrecy and called the Trifon Special, so they wouldn't give away the fact that Chrysler was working on an experimental car, Walter Chrysler rode in it and was completely entranced by the car's superior performance, ride, etc. He felt that in if they introduced this car, they would revolutionize the American automobile industry just as they had in 1924. And so he insisted that the airflow be offered not just as a DeSoto, which was a lower priced car, but also as a Chrysler. So this is the car that they showed at auto shows. And the car did in 1933, 1934, what we try to get car people to do when they look at car designs now, which is, uh, people either loved it or hated it. In fact, there was an unprecedented number of orders for the, for the new car. The difficulty was that the car embodied so many changes in terms of manufacturing technology that the plants had major difficulties producing the car. And as the months went by, some cars were delivered, some of the early cars were flawed, the rumor was, fueled by competitors, that there was something seriously and inherently wrong with the airflow design. The result was, to Walter Chrysler's bitter disappointment, that the airflow was never successful. In fact, it was the first setback that Chrysler had ever experienced, and Walter Chrysler himself abruptly retired as president of the company in 1935. We don't know whether that's related necessarily to the introduction of the airflow, but Chrysler himself never mentioned the word airflow in his autobiography. But looking at the car now, it doesn't seem so radical. But in the early 1930s, this rounded front with this waterfall grill was extremely advanced and unusual. And if you look at the car from a standpoint of its body proportions, people were so used to the passenger sitting back over the rear axle, a big tall rear end of the car, an extremely long hood terminating in a chrome encrusted vertical radiator shell. This was an extremely modern car. It doesn't look so modern now because while the airflow itself was not a commercial success, it set a new benchmark, just as Walter Chrysler foresaw, in how automobiles were designed. In fact, some historians consider the airflow the first truly modern automobile. And everything else in the 1930s followed uh, the design benchmarks that the airflow established. In fact, the first Toyota was basically, from a body standpoint, a scaled down DeSoto airflow. So it was very flu influential, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. One of the most recognizable automobiles in the world, probably the best recognized American automobile in the world, and one of the most famous brands in the world is Jeep. Jeep didn't become a part of Chrysler Corporation until Chrysler Corporation purchased American Motors. But the lineage of Jeep goes back much further than that. Uh, John North Willis founded a company called Willis Overland. And briefly, Willis Overland was the second largest producer of automobiles in the world, right after Ford. But in 1920, 
Willis Overland ran into trouble. It was overexpanded. It was uh, swollen with cars. It couldn't sell. It had commitments that it, it couldn't meet financially. And John North Willis hired Walter Chrysler, a miracle maker, to sort out Willis Overland. Chrysler didn't stay long. He put the car, uh, he put the company back on the road to financial prosperity, uh, and then he went on to form uh, Chrysler Corporation out of Maxwell Chalmers. But uh, it kept Willis Overland alive. And the connection between Chrysler and Willis Overland was, was forged. Although General Motors was a combination of dozens of different companies originally, General Motors has not really changed its corporate composition very much in its lifetime. Certainly Ford has not. But Chrysler Corporation has been a product of mergers all during its lifetime, right down to the merger with Daimler-Benz in 1998 that produced Daimler-Chrysler. And this is a genealogy chart that really traces the history of those mergers. And it's really a sort of international smorgasbord of familiar car companies. It features such names as Maserati, Mitsubishi, Simca, Lamborghini, Daimler-Benz, Auto Union, American Motors, Nash, Hudson, Chalmers, Willis Overland, Dodge, Stoddard Dayton, Maxwell Briscoe. It really is a unique slice of how the automobile industry started as a small local crude business with a lot of competitors and has gradually become a larger and larger business, more and more globalized. So it really is a fascinating history. Chrysler, along with the rest of the automobile industry, produced many, many hundreds of products for the war effort. Uh, tanks, airplane parts, engines, naval supplies, shells, even parts for the atomic bomb. It really was quite remarkable. Uh, Dodge itself produced uh, tens of thousands of trucks for the war effort. One of the trucks that they produced was a four-wheel drive truck that came to be known as the Power Wagon. And it was such a rugged, successful design that after the war, Chrysler uh, expanded the availability of the Power Wagon and sold it to domestic markets. And in fact, the design stayed in production until, at least from an export standpoint, until just about the 1970s. This is a uh, Power Wagon from 1946, and uh, we found it still plying its trade at a gas station with an enormous snow plow on the front. But the important thing about it was that it was a tow truck. And power wagons were extensively used for that sort of heavy work, uh, like towing. So we decided it was appropriate to have a power wagon and restore it uh, in the livery that it, that it had originally uh, with its tow truck rig. This is a 1948 Chrysler Town and Country. Chrysler really took what had been a utilitarian design for station wagons derived from depot hacks and uh, shooting brakes and made it into a prestige symbol. Uh, really what this car was saying was, I am of the class that has a suburban home and I can afford a car that suits a suburban lifestyle. Uh, these cars were produced, well, Woody's actually as convertibles were produced from 1946 till about 1951. And the cars themselves were really quite spectacular pieces of workmanship. Uh, extremely heavy cars, uh, just about two tons, uh, and somewhat compromised in terms of their performance by the necessity of hauling around all that weight, but still magnificent automobiles in terms of craftsmanship and stance. Uh, these cars are now probably some of the most collectible of post-war uh, Chryslers, uh, and uh, a restored example like this trades for about $80,000 on the open market. Chrysler was the last of the big three to introduce a completely new post-war design. And these cars, which were essentially derived from a pre-war design, stayed in production until 1949. But for many people, these really defined the look of Chrysler. And Chrysler itself promoted these cars as the beautiful Chrysler. But in late 1949, they made a body change. And the body change was not a revolutionary one but when mated with the Hemi engine that was introduced in 1951, you had a thoroughly modern post-war car. This is a 1951 Chrysler New Yorker, 
uh, a very conservative design, uh, but beautifully executed, a very powerful car, and very strongly built. When you close that front door of that car, that's like slamming the door on a bank vault. Despite the engineering advances that marked Chrysler products after World War II, Chrysler suffered because their designs were perceived as being stodgy. And a resurgent Ford Motor Company reclaimed the number two position in the American market uh, in 1951. Uh, Chrysler, having, having dropped into third place, needed new and fresher designs. They got them from Virgil Exner, who had been in charge of uh, advanced concepts. Uh, Exner, in 1954, was shifted over to redesign uh, the full line of Chrysler products. Uh, between the time he was hired in 1949 and the time he shifted over in 1954, he produced a series of spectacular show cars. In 1953, one of these was a car called D'Elegance, which garnered very favorable praise at the Paris Auto Show of that year. The vice president of Chrysler Export, a man by the name of C.B. Thomas, asked that Ghia uh, take that design and modify it and produce six copies that he could sell to favored uh, clients in Europe. This was the car that resulted the Chrysler Special. Uh, the mechanical components are stock Chrysler. Uh, the bodywork is a collaboration between Exner's design studio on this side and the artisans at Ghia. This is one of the six surviving cars. The first year that Virgil Exner really got his teeth into Chrysler design was 1955. And these cars were billed as the $100 million look uh, because that's what it cost to facelift the designs. And this particular 1955 Chrysler is a Chrysler 300, the first time that you could buy a production car that produced 300 horsepower. These machines, even though they weighed close to two tons, would do 125 miles an hour out of the showroom. They were not cheap. You could buy two Chevrolet Corvettes for what this car cost, but in terms of a gentleman's sport coupe, this was the ultimate Chrysler. For many collectors of Chrysler products, though, the ultimate extra designs are the cars that were introduced in 1957. This is a 1957 uh, Chrysler Imperial Southampton, a beautifully realized, heavily Italian-influenced design uh, that took the industry and the consumer market by storm. The difficulty was it had been rushed into production and the early cars in 1957 suffered from a tremendous number of fit and finish problems uh, that were finally rectified in the 1958 uh, model year cars. However, it did Chrysler's reputation with consumers a lot of damage. But the cars themselves were quite gorgeous and for many people they are the epitome of the 1950s uh, American ethos. In 1974, America experienced the first of the oil shock crises. What this did was suddenly force American manufacturers to rejoin the world automobile market. We had to build fuel efficient cars. The muscle cars for which Chrysler Corporation was known, like that Dodge Challenger uh, down in the corner, uh, were no longer going to fly in a market where people want an economy cars. And Chrysler engineers, along with everyone else's engineers in the United States, went on a crash course of building the sort of cars that Europeans had been building for years, like this, uh, like this horizon uh, here in back of me. Of course, what Chrysler will be known for in the 1980s was the K cars and specifically the minivans. It's hard to think that now these designs are over 20 years old and fast on their way to becoming qualified for antique tags themselves. But give them a little chance and they'll acquire a patina of their own and be just as collectible as some of the cars that we saw uh, on the first floor of the museum. I hope that this has whetted your appetite for the offerings of the Chrysler Museum. We've seen uh, two floors out of three. We have a collection that numbers over 220 cars and at any one time we're displaying somewhere between 65 and 70 of them. Uh, we're an easy place to get to and we're very proud of our history. We hope that you'll take the chance when you're in Auburn Hills to come by and see us uh, 
and experience the American heritage of Daimler Chrysler.